Hey everybody, it's Chris Melisinos, the Principal Evangelist for Video Games at AWS, and I'm here at the Strong National Museum of Play for the opening of their 90,000 square foot addition to this incredible museum, and I'm gonna walk you through some of the materials that are gonna be on display, not some of them, all of the materials will be on display for visitors to the museum here in Rochester, New York, before the actual museum opens, before all of the festivities start. And we're gonna start our tour through this incredible space called High Score and the World Video Game Hall of Fame. So come on, let's go. Now, when you first enter this space, you come right in here to this atrium and they have these incredible video displays up around highlighting some of the most iconic video games from the World Video Game Hall of Fame, which we can see right here on the ground, the giant, beautiful medallion here established in 2015. So these are some of the games that have been entered into their World Video Game Hall of Fame. And so you can actually come around to some of these kiosks here and play those games up on those screens right here inside of this incredible rotunda, this atrium right here in the beginning of the exhibition. So it kind of wets your whistle for what you're about to see. So we talk about the business of games. Here we have everything from the original Atari VCS, right, which is the Atari, known as the Atari 2600, to the Odyssey 2, and some of the, the games and materials of those eras. And so they walk you through the business of video games, how it got started, how it was nascent. We really didn't understand exactly what we were doing in that era, but we knew it was gonna be big. Well, actually, we didn't know it was gonna be, be big, but we knew it was fun. And I love these store display tabs. These are the actual store displays that you would have experienced when you went into a Sears or to a Montgomery Ward and had these displays up there for you to go ahead and play the newest games that uh, you had to go ahead and beg your parents to buy because, you know, back then we'd only get one or two games a year. They were a little expensive. They weren't as abundant. So you got those games and you played them forever. And in fact, what you would sometimes do is call your friends and make sure that they asked for a different game for Christmas than, or their birthday than you were getting so that way you could trade with each other. So it's kind of like building your own lending library with your friends. But these are one of the displays that back again in the late 1970s we would typically see in these big department and retail stores and go and experience those games before we bought them. And as we walk around here, there's some interactive um, touchscreen displays here. And we're going to through some of the most iconic games in the uh, Hall of Fame here. The Sims, Final Fantasy II, Ms. Pac-Man, Oregon Trail, Starcraft, Centipede, Pokemon Red and Green, that's what's here in this display. And as we come around here, I'm going to swing the camera around. Here is technology, how technology development started and all the things that the earliest video games had to go ahead and utilize or, or invent to bring video games to the public during that era. And one of the most important and lovely spaces in here, for me personally, is this corner here, which is dedicated to the late Ralph Baer. And Ralph Baer is the inventor of home video games. He invented what was the precursor to Pong, known, right, the device he created is known as the brown box, and it was named such because it was covered in brown shelf paper liner that he had lying around the house. So it's affectionately known as the brown box. And so we have the cardigan that Ralph wore when he would be downstairs working in his basement on creating these incredible toys. He even created uh, Simon and Amazatron and talking teddy bears and video pinball, an absolutely prolific inventor, and also happened to create the very first home video game machine known as the Magnavox Odyssey. And this is also personal to me because I had the opportunity to spend a day with Ralph Baer in his home in the mid-2000s and actually played against him on the original 1965 prototype, that brown box 
that then became the Magnavox Odyssey, which inspired Pong and set the trajectory for the modern video game industry that we know and love today. In this corner of the exhibition, we have the Indie Arcade, and these are some of the most popular independent video games that you know and love and play on modern machines today. Overcooked, uh, When Rivers Were Trails, Town Scaper, uh, World of Goo, of course, World of Goo, Celeste, Adulting, Trombone Champ. If anyone's ever played Trombone Champ, it's absolutely crazy and totally amazing. Uh, Lonely Mountains Downhill, Unpacking, Retro Raccoons, Narita Boy, one of my favorites, and hair nah. So again, we have not just video games from our past, but innovative video games from the incredible independent game space that are on display here at the Strong National Museum of Play in their brand new video game wing. All right, moving on. Now, when we talk about the history of video games, we talk about its importance and about the inventor. You cannot have that discussion without talking about Jerry Lawson. Jerry Lawson was the first person that actually came up with the concept for an interchangeable cartridge-based video game system that basically led to the Atari VCS and cartridge-based systems that we know today. A true pioneer and sometimes an unsung hero in the telling of our history in video games. Thank you, Mr. Lawson, for your invention, for your creation, for seeing further than the rest of the industry did to bring that innovation to the home that allowed video games to flourish. Handheld electronic games, for any of you kids that grew up in the late 80s or early 90s that ever held a Tiger Electronics or in the 80s held a Coleco uh, football game or baseball game with just red LEDs instead of graphics on the screen. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And here in this hall, you get to play on this nine foot tall football game using the same type of graphics that we had back in the day, right here, get to jump in and play. And talk about big devices here in this exhibition. How about this incredible Pong setup right here? So you can go ahead and play tennis. So you come in here, let's go ahead and slap the player one button, and there we go. This giant paddle here to go ahead and play Pong. Ooh, this thing has some weight to it. Oh, look at that, trying to go ahead and do this in reverse while holding this camera is a bit absurd. Oh, there we go, scored that single point. Um, I don't know who the, what the Strongbox Magna Color is, but I sure love that they added that little touch and detail to the exhibition here. So this massive Pong system is on display for any visitor to come and play and enjoy games that started our trajectory in the video games industry, right? From the Magnavox Odyssey to Pong, and you get to go in and play that there. Oh, and they also have one of the original Pong machines when it was released in that era that was created and programmed by Al Alcorn over at Atari. And there it is. Probably my favorite space in this whole hall is this gaming timeline that they put together. And it starts over here with Baffle Ball, which was the precursor to Pinball. And they talk about why this was important in creating these types of public experiential games that you could play. And then we saw kind of gamification or socialization of, of things like, you know, these the strongman type of machines that made it into boardwalk to boardwalk arcades. But this machine right here is a sample of the original um, system that was 
programmed to play Tennis for Two by Willie Higginbotham in the late 1950s. And this computer system, or parts of, the, of this computer, were actually used in the Manhattan Project. And so when the systems were moved to Brookhaven National Laboratories, they went ahead and created this game called Tennis for Two to acclimate people to understanding that computers are really not harmful, that it's okay that these machines are here in your backyard. How threatening can a machine be that lets you play a version of tennis on an oscilloscope? And that's what we're seeing back behind us right here. And then of course you can't talk about the history of video games without talking about Space War, which of course was created on a PDP-1 by Steve Russell and other students in the uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And um, yeah, so this was the game that gave Nolan Bushnell the inspiration to create this game, Computer Space. So we saw the, the placard early for it. Here is the, an actual computer space system. So Nolan Bushnell had seen and played that game, Space War, on a college PDP-1 and said, how do we go ahead and miniaturize this so we can bring that experience to the general public? That resulted in them starting a company called Nutting Associates and created this game, Computer Space. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And of course, their follow-on smash hit, Pong. And the funny thing about the Pong game was, how do we go ahead and teach people how to play this game in a bar where presumably they'd be drinking in as few words as possible? So it's just six words. It is avoid missing ball for high score. Let's see if I got that right. And there we go. Oh, you can't see with the light, maybe on an angle. There we go. Avoid missing ball for high score. So again, back in the beginning of the video game industry, these are the machines that acclimated the public to computers and using them to play. So remember, the first time people actually played with computers was through arcade games, through play. And that's what demystified them. That's what made them more approachable. That's what allowed people to go ahead and understand that video games and computers could be used for play and we took off from there. All right, so back to the timeline. This incredible timeline starts here in the 1970s. And not only does it describe the games that we were playing during that era, but it also talks about what was going on in the world at that time, fashion at that time, um, the, the uh, personalities of the time, like here we are, we have a picture of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Right, uh, working on the first Apple machine. Of course, there's a whole story that we can get into on another episode of Rewind about how they created Breakout. Um, but here we are, moving up to the 1970s and into the 1980s. And you can see beneath uh, the timeline, they actually have these cutouts of TVs that have a sampling of the type of games we were playing in those respective eras. So as we continue along this trajectory here, we're now moving out of the 80s into the 1990s and now we're going to move into the 2000s. So if you spend time here at the museum, you're going to be able to learn really about the key moments across this entire trajectory of history that have established video games to be the most interactive, the most engaging form of art, of content, of media that we've ever had at our disposal. And remember, it all started 50 years ago. It's truly incredible. Well, a little more than 50 years, but close enough. And the future video games will be? Well, we don't quite know yet, but we have some thoughts. As you can hear, some of the crowds are starting to move in. So I'm gonna have a limited amount of time to walk you through the next hall, but no video game exhibition wouldn't be complete without a 20 foot tall replica of a Donkey Kong cabinet that you can come and play when you visit here at the Strong National Museum of Play. And I'm determined to knock JP's high score off. And, oh, oh hi. please, hi. <laughs> Please introduce yourself to our audience. I'm Lisa Feinstein. I'm the Vice President for Advancement here at the Strong National Museum of Play. 
and Lisa was kind enough to let me get in here and shoot some of this footage before the crowds joined. So thank you so much. And as I told you, this is absolutely incredible. I just, it's so emotional walking in because it represents the stuff we started playing with as yeah. kids yeah. and then decided to make part of our lives and our profession and you've done an extraordinary job. Wow. Thank you. It's a huge team effort and we have good material to work with. It's just a wonderful legacy and video games have a huge impact on culture. So they we're do. proud to do it. They do. And you've done an excellent job of demonstrating just how amazingly awesome they are. Yep. So thank you so much. Thank I know you, you have to go get ready for the yep. big party for yep. tonight. I'm going to walk them through. And look, I got the first wristband. You got the very Number first one. one. So yes. So I'm exclusive. a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely All to right. see you. Thank you so All right. much. Have fun, Chris. Thank you. All right, so here we go. This 20 foot tall Donkey Kong cabinet. Like I said, I'm going to wipe that high score off the top. JP Dyson, Vice President here at the Strong. I'm coming after your high score, man. So in this level up hallway, this entire interactive room where you get these wristbands, you come in, you create your own avatar, and you start to go ahead and collect rewards and badges, basically, as you make your way through the entire exhibition. So I'm gonna run you through real quickly to check out this amazing space. So when you first come in here, you go ahead and get, sign up and get one of these wristbands, and you make your way over to one of these level up stations. In the level up station, you can take your wristband, touch it here and here is my character my character is laughing robot you can create and customize your own avatar here and what you need to do is make your way through the entire exhibition to fill in the periodic table of gaming so the awards that I've already gotten so far are earn modify and personalize I haven't had a lot of time to spend walking through here I'm gonna fill up as much of that periodic table as possible and you can come on over here to the periodic table wall the periodic table of video game elements and see how they've gone ahead and aligned all of the different elements that go into making video games from control, customization, art, discovery, story. And you can see how they all work together to create the video games that we enjoy today. So in the lore book here, this is the history of mazes and video games. So if I scan my band, let's see what happens. Mazes were an early part of computer games that require little memory, display easily on a grid, and can be generated with simple algorithms. Mouse in a maze allows the user to create a maze yeah, using the light pen and then watch as a mouse searched for cheese. And then we can move through this timeline here to the main frame. And you can continue progressing through this and understand the lore of game creation from its earliest days to the games that we play today. But we're on a time crunch, so I'm not going to be able to complete this one. I got to come back and get that award, so I'm going to cancel back out of there. And I know they're going to say, Quitter, you got out of that too fast. These uh, vending machines where you can't get the machines to take home, but you can go ahead and work these little experiences and kind of pick the systems that meant the most to you. So looking at this display, what systems were most important to you? Leave them in the comments. Perhaps it was a Tamagotchi, perhaps it was the Game Boy, perhaps it was a PSP or an LCD type of game. Perhaps it was Simon, and Simon was created once again by the 
inventor of home video games, Ralph Baer. Okay, so continuing moving through, they have all of these different experiences that dive into the various parts of video game development and video game history. Again, another lore book. We have more game uh, arcade machines down here, and here's the controller kiosk. Which controllers are most iconic to you growing up playing video games? For me, it's number A14. Right, that is the original Atari VCS, or known as the Atari 2600 controller that came with it. But of course, all of them are iconic. All of them have a place within my entire lifetime of playing games and working in the games industry. So they have an endless runner game where your body is the controller and you get to run through this maze. Or role playing where you actually have to roll these giant balls to go ahead and move your character forward. Stealth zone, how can you maneuver? through those spaces without being detected. Um, anyone that's ever played Metal Gear, Thief, or any of the other games that require stealth, I'm not that one. I'm the Leroy Jenkins character because I just kind of blast my way in there. Stealth is not my forte. All right, digital graffiti and pixel portraits. Oh, here we are at the console vending machine. From the PlayStation 2, the Wii, back down to the Atari VCS or the 2600, original Xbox, the beautiful, beautiful Sega Genesis, right? The original Model 1, absolutely lovely. And of course, the iconic, always, you know, top of the list right there, Nintendo Entertainment System. Coming around the corner here, we have another kiosk of characters. Which characters were most important to you or most memorable for you when you were growing up playing video games? And here is the game vending machine. Again, vending machine. You can't get the games to take home with you, but you can go ahead and craft your ultimate playlist out of the games that they have here in the vending machine. Which ones were most important for you? All right, and we are ripping through this because we have a whole crowd coming up here, and I want to make sure we get as much, as through as much of this as possible, just me and you. So again, another key has to talk about competition and how we program for competitive games and limited memory and limited systems. Die Monsters, some sort of die game. I'm gonna to have to go ahead and play it. Beat the Boss, obviously a rhythm game that you can play with your friends when you come to visit. Another driving game, and of course, Killer Queen. If you haven't played Killer Queen, it's absolutely amazing. And they have a full setup here, including the, the observation screen up top. So you can go ahead and watch those competitors play. And now we're over here to the shooting gallery side. Missile Command, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, Starblade, amazing game. Well, amazing for its time, amazing for what it did. And still super engrossing and awesome, right? NBA Jam and Smash TV, the follow-on to one of the greatest games of all time, my favorite video game, which is Robotron 2084. Smash TV is a worthy successor to that game. And there you have it. That is just a taste of the amazing experiences that are available to anybody that comes and visits the Strong National Museum of Play. Now, I'm gonna go join the party. We're gonna check out what's happening for the rest of the night, and we'll be back with more.